Game Review. Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby, and welcome back to Game Review. Uh, today, I'm going to be going over a game from the young Jeffrey Zhang in the Tata Steel Masters Tournament. Uh, of course, this tournament is nearing its close, but probably it will be over by the time this video airs. But uh, Jeffrey having a little bit of an up and down tournament, some wins, some losses, and we'll see how this game went for him uh, here today. He was playing the Russian Vladislav Artemiev, and in the game, he chose d4 and went for a queen's gambit. Artemiev chose c6, going for the Slav. Jeffrey played knight f3, knight f6, and knight c3, just developing both the knights. It's one of the main main lines, uh, and it gives white kind of a lot of options here. Black chooses a6, um, with some ideas of playing an early b5. Uh, here, after a6, white usually has the option to play this move, c5, taking advantage of the weakened dark squares for black. However, Jeffrey chooses a much simpler approach, simply playing e3. Like I said, keeping things flexible. This is uh, the way Jeffrey kind of hand handled this opening. And now black does something a little bit offbeat. Uh, generally, black expands with b5, keeping in mind this a6 push, uh, you know, keeping the ideas consistent. Uh, instead, in this game, we see this move g6. And this is a pretty committal move, actually. It's not one that I'm, I'm often a fan of. It's committing this bishop to this diagonal, which for the moment is remaining closed. And so now black is committing to putting this bishop here, and by doing so he's kind of committing to trying, trying to open up this diagonal, which is not always the easiest thing to accomplish. Uh, white plays bishop e2, black continues with bishop g7, castles, castles. Notably, this bishop does not go to d3, because this bishop might actually just meet it on the f5 square, and from d3, you're really just looking at nothing here, with h7 and g6 solidly defending this diagonal. So e2 is the better square in this case. Jeffrey continues with a4. Artemiev uh, responds in kind with a5. And you see this move from black, uh, a5, because he wants to prevent white from playing a5. Uh, instead, you can imagine a, a bishop g4, and after a move like queen b3, hitting this pawn, rook a7, a classic Slav maneuver, this move a5 uh, can really... Uh, hamper the entire black queen's side here. So we see a5 from black, keeping that idea off the books. Now, after c takes d5 and c takes d5, you see what I mean by black having committed to this bishop here. Uh, once you see the change in structure with c takes d5, it becomes very, very difficult to open up this bishop. White has good control over this e5 square for the moment. If he doesn't manage to, uh, to force this diagonal open, he's, he's going to have serious problems. Uh, Jeffrey chose a very nice way to finish development with b3. This bishop, of course, the, the notably undeveloped piece for, for white. He finds an open diagonal for it, though. Knight c6, bishop a3, is now hitting a weakness on e7. Bishop g4 is black's choice. Like I said, he needs to shake loose this e5 square so this bishop can, can kind of shine. Jeffrey doesn't really give him the chance, though. Uh... You know, a weaker player might continue with a move like rook c1, which is a fine move, but now there are ideas of capturing this piece, playing the move rook e8, and expanding uh, very, very quickly in, in the center here. Instead, though, knight e5 is Jeffrey's choice, uh, not allowing him to trade off this light squared bishop for a piece that defends the e5 square. And now black is committed into going into a, a very forced series of exchanges here. Uh, technically, you can play a move like bishop e6, but then you've wasted some time, and, and white should have an edge. So black plays the most natural way, which is to simply accept all of the exchanges here. And after uh, d takes e5, knight e4 is the only serious move here. And now white can take off this knight as well. And it looks like a lot of things have been liquidated, and black should be doing okay. The, the structure is symmetrical, he's going to be taking this pawn on e5, but the fact is, the white pieces are just coming into play a, a hair faster than the black pieces here. And because of that, black has some very, very concrete problems. And so maybe black was a little bit, uh, a little bit hasty in, in going for all of these exchanges, going for this forced line here, because Jeffrey really managed to prove an advantage. And the move queen c4 is how he did it. Queen c4, hitting this pawn on e4, 
hitting this bishop uh, or hitting this pawn on e7, and most importantly, freeing up this d1 square for for a rook to shake loose this uh, defender of the queen here. Uh, perhaps the most natural way to play was the way that Black should have played. This move, Bishop takes e5, but already Black still has some problems here. And the move, Rook d1, is very natural and perhaps the best. And after Queen b6. White kind of has his pick of, uh, of pawns to pick up here. Perhaps even the move rook d7 could be quite problematic. And in all of these lines, white just has a little bit of an edge in activity and ends up with a slightly better endgame. Uh, in the game, black chose not to go in for these endgames, uh, instead going for a different endgame with this move queen d3. Uh, this move forces the queens off the board, uh, which Jeffrey accepts. And after rook d1 now, you see bishop e5, and rook takes d3. And this is the problem with a lot of openings that, uh, that look like this for, for black here. You know, you get this symmetrical structure, and it feels like you should have equalized, it feels like things should be okay, but the white pieces somehow just have a little bit of edge in, in time due to that first move. Uh, and here it's, it's no different. Black still has problems to solve. This pawn on e7 is hanging, and the rook is already on the open file. That's kind of two uh, advantages that, that white has here in the position. And Jeffrey does a very nice job of turning this into a concrete material edge. We see rook fd8 from black. Jeffrey plays very principled. He doesn't want to give his opponent the open file, so he supports this rook with rook d1, not capturing on d8, although that would have also given him a nice edge. We see rook takes d3, rook takes d3, rook c8, and then Jeffrey took on e7, and the game was over. Just kidding. Uh, Jeffrey plays g4, not hanging back rank mate. Bishop f6 now. Black had to defend this pawn at some point. Now rook d5 is Jeffrey's move. And this move is annoying. Uh, it's just, it's annoying how this little, little tiny advantage in time is being turned into something so concrete and something so problematic for Black. This pawn is attacked on a5, black defends it, and here a nasty move might have been g5 for Jeffrey. It's definitely worth considering. Of course, you can't really move this bishop, because this pawn will hang. You do have this intermezzo though, e6, and then bishop d8 would defend b6, which is probably why Jeffrey didn't want to go for this. But it turns out this endgame is, is still quite favorable for white. Instead of g5, Jeffrey chooses rook b5 immediately, also very, very strong. And now the problem with playing a move like rook c6 to defend is now this g5 move will come, there's no e6 intermezzo, and this pawn will hang. Uh, that's why black chose this move, bishop h4, going for counterplay along the second rank himself. Jeffrey simply picks up his free pawn. And after rook c2, he tries to tie everything together with this move f3, which is a very nice move. This bishop comes to f2 check, king h1. Black regains his pawn for a moment, but after a check, and king g7, white takes an e-pawn, and now uh, white is, is simply up, up a solid pawn, and all that's left to do is consolidate and, and win the endgame. Of course, black does have some pressure around this king, and there are a couple weaknesses to, to look out for, but Jeffrey handles it very, very well. Black actually starts with this move f5, and uh, this move was aimed at loosening up a, a couple more pawns in the white camp, but this move always comes with its downsides. In the game, Jeffrey chose rook b7, pointing out the fact that this pawn no longer defends the king. This king comes back to g8. Now after g takes f5 and g takes f5, this rook can come to b5, and it turns out black might have just weakened his own pawns rather than, rather than the white pawns here. I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about this whole f5 idea from him. Uh, now, uh, black pushes with f4, trying to create some more threats around the white king, supporting this bishop as well. Jeffrey simply picks up another pawn on a5, and now the end game is pretty hopeless. Uh, this king comes to f7, but at the end of the day, it's not enough to compensate for this queen side majority. Bishop h4, rook b2, hits this pawn, white simply defends, bishop d4, a5, and now we see the pawns ever so slowly start to roll up the board. Uh, a few more checks, a few more maneuvering moves. 
because bishop actually comes to d8 to defend this a pawn. Uh, kind of nice long range defense. Black goes after this f pawn, but it's too little, too late. After bishop h4, this pawn is actually untouchable due to a very funny rook trap. So, the rook comes back to a2, we repeat once, this rook comes back to f2, now we see rook d1. Now if you were to capture this pawn, you're simply not in time to stop uh, the, the queen's side pawns. So we see rook b2 instead, oh, not rook g2, rook b2 instead, bishop e7 defense, rook a2, now bishop c5. Always transposing into winning endgames if you're not careful. Rook c1, and this pawn is too powerful. So instead we see h4, this bishop comes to d4, rook a4, and once again, a lot of moves being played here, but the result was never in doubt. Rook a1, once again, giving black the opportunity to transpose into a more clear endgame, but the fact is, this endgame is simply losing, as we soon find out. Uh, white plays king g1, keeping an eye on this e pawn, not letting it get too far. And after rook d4, king f1 guards the e2 square. Rook d2, and now Jeffrey had it all calculated out. a6, uh, rook takes h2. Uh, king g1 is his choice. Rook d2, now a7, e2. Jeffrey gets a queen after this check. Artemiev gets a queen, but the downside for black is white gets to move, uh, which is kind of the theme of the game here. White's always just one step ahead, and that is the case here as well. Despite the material being technically even, this king is super exposed, and white gets a turn to go and try to checkmate it, which he does. Queen c6 check, king h5, queen c5 check, king h6, and now... It's the simple step ladder mate that we're all familiar with, where the major pieces corral this king up the board, and after queen c7 check, uh, black went ahead and resigned here. Of course, no way to stop the checkmate, or at the very least, no way to avoid giving up a full queen. Uh, and so this is a very well played game by Jeffrey actually, uh, taking advantage of that one extra tempo that he had, keeping his activity, and turning it into a concrete advantage. And then showing some very nice endgame technique, never letting his opponent back into the game, and ending with a victory. Uh, well, that just about does it. Thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Game Review. My name is Caleb Denby, and I'll see you in the next episode.